Today, we are privileged to host Dr. Ashok Litwin Kumar. Dr. Litwin Kumar studied physics at Caltech and then did a PhD in computational neuroscience at Carnegie Mellon, advised by Dr. Brent Joyran. He then moved to Columbia University, uh, where he did a postdoc advised uh, by Larry Abbott and Richard Axel. He's now an assistant professor at the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at Columbia. Thank you so much for being here to present, Dr. Litwin Kumar. Uh, whenever you're ready to begin, feel free. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that introduction and for the invitation. I'm going to talk today about work that uh, was done with a student, Marjorie, and a postdoc, Sam, in my lab, as well as our collaborator, Cameron Decker Harris at Western Washington. And you know, my group in general is interested in the relationship between structure and function in neural circuits and is really inspired by the uh, great divergence in connectivity and anatomy of different cell types across the brain. One of the most striking dichotomies there is this distinction between cerebral cortical systems and cerebellum-like systems, where in the cerebellar cortex, for instance, you have cell types with five orders of magnitude difference in connectivity, granule cells that each get three to five inputs, Purkinje cells that get hundreds of thousands, as well as this seemingly disordered connectivity onto granule cells. And I don't think I need to tell this audience that this feature of having a granule cell-like layer with many neurons and sparse connectivity isn't unique to the cerebellar cortex. It's also present in other cerebellum-like systems uh, across uh, vertebrate and invertebrate species, suggesting perhaps a shared computational function of these cerebellum-like systems. So today I'm going to talk about theoretical work we've done, uh, extending models of computation in cerebellum-like systems. And to start, I'm going to start as many modelers do with MAR all this models of the cerebellum, right? So in these models, the idea is you have mossy fibers innervating the cerebellar cortex that respond to different sensory motor features. And the role of the granule cell layer is to respond to different combinations of these features, creating a combinatorial representation of the sensory motor environment. And it's assumed that this is established through random connectivity from mossy fibers onto granule cells. Then the role of this representation is to support learning downstream by the Purkinje cells, which is accomplished through the adjustment of synaptic weights from the granule cell layer onto the, the Purkinje cell. And of course, this is a, a very simple theory, but it's attractive for theorists because it's kind of a prototypical example of a single hidden layer neural network with a wide and random intermediate representation with supervised learning happening at the output. And what's kind of remarkable is that even in the past decade or two, uh, there have been a number of theoretical works kind of relating features of cerebellar anatomy to uh, uh, this kind of model. And I'm gonna give an overview of a, a couple of those. So uh, one of them is this kind of classic result on the distribution of synaptic weights onto Purkinje cells uh, done by Nicola Brunel and colleagues who found that if you assume that the granule cells are representing random inputs. And uh, the job of the Purkinje cell is essentially to act like a perceptron and classify those inputs into two uh, arbitrary binary categories. And you assume that the weights are non-negative, then you can match quite well the distribution of uh, uh, EPSPs uh, from uh, granule cells onto Purkinje cells, and in particular, the prevalence of so-called silent synapses, 
On the other hand, if you're looking at the responses of the granule cells themselves, there have been a number of theoretical works arguing for the importance of sparse activity across granule cells, in particular, the notion that if you're doing a categorization task uh, in order to produce a high dimensional representation, you want few, let's say one to 10% of your granule cells to be active for any given input. And this uh, kind of minimizes the error in the classification performed by this perceptron-like Purkinje cell. Uh, you can make a similar story for the number of inputs received by each granule cell. We showed that having you know three to five inputs per granule cell is optimal in terms of maximizing the dimension of the granule cell representation. And you can also look at the ratio of the number of granule cells uh, to Mossy fibers, this so-called expansion ratio. And if you look at the numbers corresponding to the granule cells and Mossy fibers presynaptic to one Purkinje cell, which is something like 200,000 and 7,000 respectively, at least for, for uh, uh, rodents, um, you get that this number is kind of near the point at which the benefits of increasing the size of the granule cell layer begins to saturate. So as a theorist, I find these uh, observations really satisfying and, and coherent, um, but at the same time, they required making a, a pretty strong assumption about what the system is doing. Namely, its job is just to take random inputs and map it onto random zero or one responses in the Purkinje cell. So what I'm gonna talk about today is kind of extending that to more realistic scenarios. And so there are two things I'm gonna focus on uh, that are related. One is uh, extending the model beyond random inputs and outputs, in particular, motivated by the idea that a lot of tasks in particular sensory motor tasks might involve inputs that lie in some low dimensional uh, neural manifold, this kind of neural state space idea that uh, uh, Krishna Shinoy, among others, has uh, popularized. Uh, and also kind of questioning the, the role of uh, sparsity in the granule cell representation motivated by a number of recent studies that have suggested that maybe the granule cells aren't quite as sparse in their activity as uh, we previously thought. So let me build up the modeling framework that I'm going to use to address these questions today. So we're gonna start with an input X and we're gonna assume that that input is D dimensional. And here D is going to represent the number of variables that are important for whatever task the organism is performing. Okay, so this is the dimension of the task space. And those task variables are going to be embedded in the activity of an ensemble of Mossy fibers. And for now, we're just gonna assume that that embedding is linear. So there's some matrix A that takes the task variables and, and creates uh, input layer representation. And we're gonna imagine that D is probably a lot less than N for tasks of interest. Um, that input is gonna then be passed to a layer of uh, granule-like cells and uh, the granule cell responses are gonna be created by passing that input through those two matrices, A and J. And so you can really think of the granule cells responses as being determined by what I'll call a set of effective weights that go from task variables to inputs onto granule cells. And those effective weights are determined both by the actual synaptic connectivity between Mossy fibers and granule cells, the matrix J, and also how the task variables are embedded in the Mossy fiber layer, which is the matrix A. And for now, I'm going to make a, a strong simplifying assumption that this J effective can just be thought of as uh, a matrix with random Gaussian entries. And I'm gonna return to that later, um, but that's gonna make our analysis uh, kind of uh, 
simple and reduce the number of parameters we need to think about for much of the time. This input is then going to be passed through a nonlinearity, which in our case we'll just be studying a rectified linear nonlinearities with a threshold so that every neuron in the network um, has uh, is active for a fraction f of the, the inputs. And, and f is, I'll call it the, the coding level of the intermediate layer, the granule cell layer. Then finally, the job uh, of the system, as in the standard frameworks, is to do supervised learning using this intermediate layer representation. And just to highlight you know, the kind of things that we're going to be particularly focused on that kind of go beyond the standard moral, this picture that was used to derive the previous results. You know, what I've set up here is essentially the framework that was used in all of the previous papers, but we're going to be one varying the coding level and seeing what the consequences are. And we're also going to be considering more of uh, a broader set of choices for X and its mapping to a target F of X, which is what the Perkins cell is trying to learn. So let's start by talking about this mapping from X to f of x, which is essentially what defines the task that this system is learning. Okay, so let's start with kind of a, a simple binary categorization task, the, the, the typical one. You might imagine having a set of patterns, some of which are maybe associated with a reward and some of which are not, which I'm illustrating with these blue and red circles in the so-called task space of x. And in this situation, what you might want to do is to have a Purkinje cell that responds to the, the blue examples and doesn't respond to the red examples. And so maybe your f of x looks something like this, where you want it to respond if it's close to a blue example and not respond if it's close to a red example. This kind of region around the circles I drew is what you would want if you wanted to be tolerant to noise in your input space, right? Okay, so that's kind of, you know, associative learning for binary categorization tasks. But what we were particularly motivated to look at is what happens if we try and build a task that's maybe a little closer to the role a system like this might play in something like the control of smooth movements, where maybe the function you're trying to learn is like a predicted X at some time point in the future. And there's some you know, smooth dynamical system that governs the dynamics you're trying to learn. In that case, you might imagine that the function F of X that the system is trying to approximate has a much smoother structure than the uh, one that I illustrated on the left. And to make our job simple for now, I'm going to not talk about any particular task, but just generate targets f of x for the system to learn where really the only property that I've imposed is that they have this smooth structure. And so I'm going to just say, what if the system is learning a Gaussian process, which is just a, a smooth function uh, with some length scale gamma that I can control that tells me kind of on what spatial scale is that function varying. Later, I'm gonna talk about more realistic tasks, but this again is gonna allow us to, to have control over what the system is learning. Okay, so with that, I can build a network that performs these learning tasks. And in the case of you know, associative learning of inputs that belong to two categories, the, the task might look something like this, at least if we were in two dimensions. Uh, and as is kind of consistent with previous work, if you train a system to do this and look at the performance of that system as you vary the uh, coding level in the granule cell layer, the level of sparsity in the granule cells, you find a result that's consistent with, with previous studies showing that sparse activity in the granule cells and kind of optimizes the performance for this task. What if we now consider an ensemble of tasks with this so-called smooth 
structure that I introduced. So learning a function f of x that looks like this. What we found is that the picture changes quite a bit in kind of a qualitative way, where now the level of granule cell activity that maximizes performance is both task dependent and can be quite a bit larger than it ever was for networks that were just doing binary categorization. So this was something that was different from uh, the kind of classic Mar all this picture of sparse activity and granule cells being optimal. And we wanted to develop a theory to understand you know, what, what are, what's driving this results and why is the optimal coding level in the granule cells now task dependent. To do so, um, and to give you an intuition for what's driving this effects, I'm going to start by talking just about the mapping from inputs, task variables, onto responses in the granule cell layer. Uh, and I think a useful way to think about it is something like this. So let's just imagine for a moment that the inputs are three-dimensional. Uh, and I'm also for now going to assume that they lie on the surface of a sphere. This kind of makes the, the diagram prettier. Um, and in that situation, it's possible for every granule cell to define a preferred stimulus. That is the stimulus that excites that granule cell the most. It would correspond to the direction in X space uh, defined just by the row of the matrix J effective. And if you present a particular input, let's say X1, then those granule cells that respond to X1 are going to be those whose preferred stimulus is aligned enough with the vector X1 so that their input is above threshold. For a different stimulus X2, there's going to be a different ensemble of granule cells that are activated, again, defined by, you know, is their preferred stimulus close enough to X2? And there's also going to be some overlap between these blue and red granule cells, uh, which is illustrated in purple. If I now vary the threshold of the granule cells so that fewer of them are active, a higher threshold, I'm going to change how many are active, and I'm also going to change how many are coactive for both X1 and X2. And in fact, as you might see, the kind of ratio of the purple to the blue or red areas is going down as I increase the threshold. And this is something that we in neuroscience often call pattern separation. The sparser I make the responses, the more pattern separation between X1 and X2 I get. This can be quantified in a plot where I plot the as a function of the similarity between the inputs, X1 and X2, the similarity in the granule cell responses, M1 and M2. And if I do so for different coding levels, different fractions of granule cells active, I get different curves like this. And a few things I want to point out about this. One, you know, the curve is coding level dependent. And for small coding levels, sparse responses, it's further from the, the unity line. Um, second thing I want to point out is a connection between what I'm plotting here is, and what is called in the machine learning community the kernel corresponding to this intermediate layer representation. And I'll talk about that some more in the next slide. And uh, just the fact that these curves all lie behind, below the unity line is an illustration of the fact that these networks are performing some degree of pattern separation. And the more pattern separation there is, the further this line is from the unity line. Okay. Um, so the reason that I introduced this kernel language and, and uh, told you about these effects is because it kind of leads me into the connection with some machine learning work that gives us some tools for relating the ability of systems like this, whose kernel that we can calculate, um, 
to their ability to learn different tasks. In particular, there's a, a nice set of, of results that have been applied to uh, deep neural networks and shallow neural networks in recent years uh, on kind of the theory of kernel regression. And I'm gonna give you kind of an overview of, of how these techniques work. The kind of key idea is if I have a function that I wanna learn, some f of x, I can break that function down into a set of so-called basis functions. In 2D, these kind of look like 2D Fourier modes for the, the network that I set up. Uh, and what these uh, uh, techniques give me is a way for uh, a way to quantify, quantify how easy are these different components of f of x to learn. Uh, in particular, for any function I'm trying to learn, I can break it down into a set of basis functions, which are described by a frequency corresponding to, you know, low frequencies for C1 here and high frequencies for C8 and so on. Uh, and any f of x is going to have a particular decomposition. And, you know, for one dimension, this is kind of the familiar Fourier decomposition of some f of x where x is a scalar. And kind of, as you might expect, for the three functions that I'm showing you on the current slide, uh, the one with the small length scale, the, the rightmost one, has more high frequency content. Okay. And the kind of key quantity that I can use to ask, you know, is a network able to learn f of x well or not able to learn f of x well is something that I can compute using uh, this theory, which is uh, an eigenvalue associated with each of these frequencies. And the, the kind of uh, intuition is just a high eigenvalue means it's more easy for that network to learn that frequency, okay? So I'm showing this eigenvalue spectrum uh, for networks with two different coding levels, uh, sparse, act, sparsely active granule cell layer in the, the light purple and a densely active granule cell layer in the dark purple. And what you'll note is that in the sparse network, there's more, uh, the, the eigenvalues are higher for high frequency components. So you might say that this network has an easier time learning high frequency functions. In the machine learning community, this is known as the inductive bias of these two networks. And you might say that the sparse network has a inductive bias toward learning high frequency functions, whereas the densely active network has an inductive bias toward learning low frequency functions. And if you kind of match up the function you're trying to learn on the left to the inductive bias of the network on the right, you might predict that uh, the sparse network would have an easier time learning the, the quickly varying function and the densely active network would have an easier time learning the uh, slowly varying function, the one on the left. And that's essentially what this theory provides us. If you give me an f of x and you give me a network for which I can compute the kernel and figure out these eigenvalues, I can tell you whether or not the network's inductive bias matches the thing that I'm trying to learn. And using this theory, I can um, quantify uh, the predicted learning performance as defined by mean squared error of the, the Purkinje cell readout and get a nice match that uh, accounts for this changing optimal coding level as I go from uh, quickly varying target functions to slowly varying target functions. So there's kind of a, a satisfying match between theory and simulation. Um, now I wanna step back though and ask, how does what I just told you relate to previous results, which concluded that you know, sparse activity was always optimal for learning these binary categorization tasks. Um, and the point I want to make is that if a system is trying to just separate inputs that are random into two categories, a plus one category and a minus one category, there are really only two length scales that are important. 
one length scale is the typical separation between two different inputs. Uh, right? You want that to be large enough so that you can draw a boundary that separates the plus ones from the minus ones. And that's kind of why pattern separation is useful for binary categorization task. It essentially pulls things apart. And indeed, you can show for the networks that I described that essentially having a large degree of pattern separation, that is the having the slope of this function near zero be small, so it's far away from the unity line, is the thing that maximizes the dimension and the learning performance uh, kind of consistent with what people had looked at previously. There's a second length scale, which is the effect, uh, kind of the typical size of the noise that surrounds each of these points. And the reason you don't want kind of infinitely sparse responses is you don't want to separate noisy versions of the same pattern so much that they're unable to be distinguished from other patterns. But for these tasks in which there isn't any structure, this kind of benefit of pattern separation is always kind of the dominant effect leading to a prediction that you want your granule cells to be active to one to 10% of the, the patterns that are presented. On the other hand, for tasks which, with more structure, there's a, a much wider range of length scales which are important, and there's kind of structure present on all sorts of different scales, which is something you can see by plotting the distribution of overlaps for the categorization tasks in purple and these low dimensional tasks um, with smooth structure on the right. You kind of see this bimodal bimodality in uh, the overlaps for the categorization tasks reflecting these two length scales in purple, but uh, broad distribution on the right, which is kind of why we needed all these tools to account for uh, uh, kind of all of the different frequency components present in uh, the learning of these kinds of FMX functions. Okay, so that's the overview of the theory. Now let's turn to what this means for the kinds of tasks we might be interested in neuroscience. Uh, so. We can simulate, for instance, a network that is trying to predict the state of a very simple model of a two-joint arm. In this case, X is six-dimensional. It represents various kinematic variables, positions, velocities, and torques. And we're just asking the network to predict state of the system at some time delay delta in the future. And what we get is, uh, again, kind of consistent with the notion that this is a low dimensional task with a large degree of, kind of smoothness in the mapping because it comes from a smooth dynamical system. We get a predicted optimal coding level, which is around 0 0.3, a lot higher than would be predicted for uh, a, a random categorization task. And our proposal is that perhaps some of the observations of dense granule cell activity that have been made in recent years are being driven by the fact that often the tasks in which recordings are made are ones in which the animal is doing something low dimensional and smooth. Uh, just for consistency, if we instead model something more akin to you know, the kind of odor categorization into a petitive or aversive, that uh, an insect's mushroom body, another cerebellum-like system might do. We kind of get the, the picture from before where X is random and high dimensional, F of X is plus or minus one, and the optimum is again, some you know, sparse activity. And indeed in fruit flies, it, it's estimated that five to 10% of Kenyan cells are active uh, in, in their olfactory system. We can also do things uh, for other tasks uh, in other systems. So we adapted a model from Ann Kennedy and colleagues of responses in the electrosensory lateral line lobe of electric fish. 
Uh, there, the job of the system is to produce a negative image of self-generated electric fields produced by the discharge of the electric organ. And there, we actually have a very realistic model of granule cell responses that are uh, compared to in vivo recordings. And you know, again, we predict a uh, relatively high coding level. And the in this case, the, the purple arrow corresponds to the estimated degree of uh, sparsity of the granule cell responses in here from the recordings. And you, you find that it's sitting kind of around the, the elbow in this curve, which is nice. Uh, Finally, we did a, a very simple model of uh, VOR in which uh, we assumed some tuning curves to head direction of mossy fibers and, and Purkinje cells. And I would say there, what we find is sparse activity is sufficient, but the kind of optimum range is pretty broad. And so unfortunately, we don't have a very strong prediction, except that I guess if you wanted to, to be energetically efficient, then you could get away with sparse responses, at least the way we set up this model. But kind of more broadly, the idea is that if we can build a good model of mossy fiber responses and uh, the target that the Purkinje cell is trying to produce, then under the assumption of kind of disordered connectivity on granule cells, we can make a prediction about whether or not sparse activity or dense activity is optimal uh, depending on the structure of the task. Yeah. Okay, so one thing I wanna point out here, I've kind of told you that one of the conclusions of all these nice theoretical studies that related the anatomy and function of the cerebellum to you know, the learning performance is kind of not consistent if you change the assumptions, right? You change the task, and now you no longer predict that uh, sparse activity is optimal. And you might, might be worried that, what about all, all the other nice things that we concluded about the distribution of weights and so on? Uh, are those now all also going to be task dependent? So another thing we did in this paper was ask, what happens if we put in these smooth tasks and look at all these other optima? And kind of the reassuring thing is that even if the system is learning something smooth and low dimensional, you still predict this uh, high fraction of silent synapses from granule cells onto Purkinje cells. You still find that three to five connections per granule cell is optimal. And you still uh, obtain a benefit from the high degree, uh, high expansion in number of neurons from mossy fibers to granule cells, even if the inputs are low dimensional. So what it seems to look like is that these anatomical features, of the wiring of cerebellar cortex, are kind of optimal across tasks, but the coding level is something where the optimum may depend on the structure of the task. And that suggests kind of a, an interesting uh, hypothesis that perhaps different cerebellum-like systems, different regions of the cerebellum, or maybe even the same region at different moments in time, depending on task demands, might have different degrees of sparsity in the responses uh, to kind of accommodate different task demands. Okay, so in the last five minutes, I want to return to one of the assumptions that I made in setting up this model, which is the assumption that the effect of mapping from the variables of interest in the task to the responses in the granule cells can be assumed to just be some random Gaussian mapping. You know, in reality, these responses are generated by, in the cerebellum, uh, in, in many regions of the cerebellum by taking input, say, from the cortex, passing it through the pontine nuclei, and then uh, onto the granule cells. And so really, the picture looks something more like this, in which there's a representation of the task in the, the blue neurons, the cortical neurons, and then uh, this compression by the matrix A followed by an expansion J. And 
Sam already talked about the, the theory that we've developed um, for these kind of compression followed by expansion systems. And I'm not going to rehash that, but I'm going to describe one point which is relevant to, to this paper that, that we discussed in it, which is, you know, what is required for this J effective to be something like random Gaussian allowing you to kind of mix arbitrary combinations of task variables. And the answer is going to depend on how the input layer in the model I just showed you representing the cortical neurons, how they represent different task variables. And we found it useful to distinguish between two different kinds of representations, which we call clustered and distributed. In a clustered representation, different neurons each care about one particular task variable, and you can kind of segregate cells depending on their selectivity to one variable or another. Whereas in a distributed representation, each neuron has some idiosyncratic tuning to a, a combination. And so we're going to ask which of these kinds of representations, when we take that as our assumption for how things are encoded in the cortex, uh, affects the performance of, of learning by a Purkinje sum. So let's start with the distributed case. So what I'm going to show here is a network in which, sorry, I again have 7,000 mossy fibers going into the granule cells and a task which is three-dimensional. And if I assume that those mossy fibers uh, represent inputs from the cortex in a, a distributed way, then I somewhat remarkably find that the performance of my network, whether when I make it sparse, that is each granule cell only gets four out of the 7,000 inputs, is no different at all from a kind of fully connected Gaussian case. And so I don't have any drop in performance, even though I've sparsified from 7,000 down to four, which is kind of surprising to us. The reason for this is that if you look at the similarity between the effective inputs that two different granule cells get, two rows of this matrix that are created by multiplying the mossy fiber to granule cell activity with how things are embedded in the mossy fibers, then as long as you have enough mossy fibers and each of them has some idiosyncratic tuning to different task variables, you essentially converge to a case that's totally equivalent to the random Gaussian one. It's only if you have very few mossy fibers, say 10 or 50, that you run into issues of you know, some directions not being represented as well as other directions, and you kind of don't span the full space of different combinations of task variables. So that what this is, is that a distributed representation is sufficient uh, when you have sparse connectivity, or maybe the other way around. Sparse connectivity is sufficient when you have a distributed representation. What about the clustered case? In this case, there actually is a pretty big difference um, from introducing sparsity at the, the granule cell layer. And the reason for this is that when things are clustered, you have certain combinations that are represented more than other combinations just by chance, just by the kind of random embedding of X1 and X2 into the mossy fiber activity, and adding more mossy fibers isn't going to change that because their tuning is preserved. Right, you, you, they, they, you still have clusters that represent X1, X2, up to however many dimensions to find the task. So the conclusion from this is that if you have a distributed representation and uh, a low dimensional task, then you can get away with sparse connectivity. What I didn't show you is that if you, the dimensionality is high, then it doesn't really matter. You can do either distributed or clustered, and you'd be just fine. And as we discussed in Sam's paper, we think this is perhaps one of the differences between the olfactory system of insects and the 
um, cerebral, the cerebellar cortex, um, where one is kind of operating on low dimensional inputs in, let's say, a motor control task, and the other one is operating kind of high dimensional random odor patterns. And this kind of explains why you have clustered representations in the antenna lobe of insects and potentially why you have distributed representations feeding in to the, the ponti nuclei and, and uh, the corticocerebellar loop. Okay, so with that, let me just kind of explain our thinking about what we've changed about this picture, um, kind of small modifications to it. So what I've argued is that maybe we should be thinking about the inputs to the mossy fibers in models of tasks beyond random input to output mappings as something more low dimensional, structured, and potentially pre-processed by the uh, corticocerebellar uh, pathway. I've still assumed that the connectivity from mossy fibers to granule cells is random, or at least approximately random. Um, instead of assuming that the granule cells have sparse responses, I've shown you that depending on the structure of the task, perhaps sparse or less sparse responses are optimal. And I also have not changed the assumption that the Purkinje cells are doing supervised learning, which I would say is kind of a very important direction for re-examination going forward. Okay, I will end there by again acknowledging Marjorie and Sam who did most of the work as well as other collaborators on uh, these two papers which I'm showing you references to uh, and happy to take questions. Feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions. Go ahead. Yeah, go. Is that me? Asha, great talk. Um, I really enjoyed speculating uh, as you were presenting how the nervous system might um, titrate the sparsity. Um, do you think that neuromodulation is, is a plausible mechanism for, for adjusting the sparsity in the granule cells and matching it to the dimensionality of the, the task or the behavior? Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a really interesting question, and I agree, kind of fun to speculate on. So, I mean, first, I'll say that the theory that I presented to you is kind of agnostic as to what sets the degree of sparsity in the granule cells. You could imagine it being controlled just by the input itself, the kind of basis representation of the task, say, in the cortex being fed in. You could also imagine it being controlled by uh, inhibition, and you could imagine it being controlled by neuromodulation. And it'd be very cool to see perhaps a situation in which uh, the same network is doing very different tasks with very different demands and maybe adjusting uh, uh, its, its sparsity level. You could also imagine kind of looking across different regions of the cerebellum and making hypotheses about regions that may be doing things with more smooth structure and other reasons that really need to do, you know, discrimination and, and kind of separate things into different categories. And it would be cool to correlate that with some measure of, of average granule cell activity. That would be kind of the prediction of the model. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Hi, uh, I have a question. Um, so yeah, beautiful um, theory. Thank you for the talk. Um, so uh, just wondering, in your model, everything is linear up until the final readout stage, right? Um, so I just wonder if you can comment on how how well justified is that assumption in terms of the, the physiology, and uh, what what would be the impacts of um, you know incorporating nonlinearity to you know throughout the, all, all the legs of your 
Well, yeah. So, I mean, I will say that the most important nonlinearity here is at the, the granule cell layer. Um, so that's what allows us to generate sparse responses. But I, I think you're very correct in saying that it would be important to look at what happens if the task variables are embedded in a nonlinear way in these blue neurons? What if the, um, say, the pontine neurons have a nonlinearity as well? So um, a few things. One, you know, there, there are some models in machine learning about um, nonlinear embeddings because that's kind of how we think of for instance, image data, and it would be very cool to try and port some of those techniques over. Um, one thing I can say that we take as somewhat of a justification for focusing on the strongest nonlinearity happening at the granule cells is that at least in, uh, given what we know about pontine responses, they do appear to be at a higher firing rate with potentially kind of a baseline level of activity that would allow them to operate in a more linear regime than extremely sparsely firing granule cells. Um, and, you know, whether or not linear or nonlinear embeddings are appropriate for the cortical responses kind of depends on how much you believe the, you know, that PCA is a good way of doing dimensionality reduction on, on cortical responses. Uh, in the paper with Sam, uh, we did find that introducing a simple ReLU nonlinearity at the pontine layer didn't help. Uh, that is kind of two layers of nonlinearity at both the orange and the green layer was no better than one nonlinearity at the green layer, at least if you assume that that nonlinearity isn't learned through supervised learning. Of course, if you could learn through supervised learning kind of the optimal nonlinear embedding in the pontine nucleus, you could imagine that it's now its own little kind of layer of a deep network and you could do that. Uh, I think I see a, a hand from Jorge. Yeah. Um, hello, um, I'm Jorge Ramirez, uh, the Champalima Foundation in Megan Curious Lab. And I, I was, I had two questions, but the first one is related specifically to that um, plot where you show the, uh, illustrated the pattern separation of yeah. granule cells. And then uh, I wonder, yes, that when the threshold of the granule cells somehow is increased, you have a different pattern separation, but it made me wonder also what happens if uh, granule cells have a feedback coming from, for example, Golgi cells that uh, will create maybe uh, inhibition, a contrast effect that will create maybe sparsity of their coding as well, an extra one. I don't know um, what, for example, could be the role of the Golgi cells there for the granule cell encoding. Um, yeah, yeah, good question. So, um, I mean, if the inhibition is assumed to be global, then I would say kind of the effect of the kernel would be similar to kind of changing the sparsity level, right? That feedback inhibition could be a way of regulating the sparsity level. If that feedback is specific and you know, very structured. You could imagine that it having a, a more sophisticated effect on this kernel. And I'll also point out that in general, like I plotted the kernel just as a function of the overlap between X1 and X2. But if you have a very, you know, non-uniform distribution of synaptic weights, if for instance, you somehow learned the mossy fiber to granule cell synaptic weights through gradient descent or something, then it might not just depend on x1.x2. It might, there might be particular x's that are much better represented than other x's because the system has learned to care about certain inputs and not other inputs. So the kind of ability to reduce the kernel into just one plot is an, a, comes from the assumption that the the mixing is random. So I just want to point that out. 
you had an, a second question? Uh, the the second question was more of uh, a let's say just a corroboration of uh, the idea that uh, the kernel that you used this one idea in which you said uh, said um, you define a set of basis functions of uh, frequencies at which the granule cells might be firing and on components at least in the frequency and I wonder if um, that could also somehow be a representation of the possibility that granule cells have let's say uh, basis functions but in time like they are somehow encoding a sequence of events in time rather than maybe on the frequency domain or or maybe in a different dimension such as that could it be yeah yeah good good point and yeah i would say that one of the the greatest uh, sins of this modeling work is that we really don't think very hard about temporal dynamics of course you could kind of if you assumed that you you could just break time up into different chunks and call each moment in time a pattern and define some F that depends on each of those patterns, then you could kind of accommodate uh, a temporal learning task in this framework. But there would be no sense in which kind of adjacent time points are related to one another or the learning takes advantage of the fact that things are continuous in time. Um, so yeah, I mean, if time is just another task variable that depend that determines your input and output representation, then it, you can kind of just fold it into X. Uh, but yeah, there certainly needs to be more work done on how these conclusions change when you really explicitly model temporal responses. The only place we did that here was in our models of the uh, electrosensory system in fish, where we had a good kind of dynamic model of granule cell responses based on the work of Ann Kennedy and colleagues. Thank you. Yeah, I see a hand from Hokin's iPhone. Hi, thank you so much. It's beautiful. So my question is, so the deep um the deep learning literature have the the like they have the neural tangent kernel stuff, so it's also like uh like uh, like so you can also apply the kernel theory into the deep neural networks. But my question is, do you have any intuitions like why, like given like the deep learning literature can also be like put into the like uh, like boundary of the this kernel theory, why like why is there a balance in shallow? Yeah, uh, I mean, the kind of short answer is for fast learning. You know, we here are assuming the tools that we're using are very similar to those, basically identical to those used in the neural tangent kernel literature. And assuming that the connectivity from mossy fibers to granule cells is random, essentially means that we're not doing like deep representation learning uh, and we're you know doing learning at the readout and that enables kind of fast learning you don't need to completely reshape your representation in order to learn a, a new input output mapping you just rely on the high dimensional uh, uh, diverse set of responses in your intermediate layer and there's some nice work from Alex Kaikogaich on how high dimensional random representations are also good, not just for um, you know, pattern separation, but also for speeding up learning. Thank you. Any other questions? I can't see everyone, so I may be missing hands. I think you just answered my question. So, <laughs> so the same. Uh, but but in general, if the <clears throat> if the uh, uh, mossy fiber to granule cells uh, uh, connections are actually learned, or e even in the pontine are learned, or even in the cortex, the pontine cells learn what they send to the cerebellum. Um, I mean, it's kind of puzzling in a way why you have this i mean you have this very wide network or layer in the granular cells and and you know the deep learning literature like learning capacity really takes off with with more stacked nonlinear layers so can you speculate 
why the brain has developed this this massive white layer um, rather than going with what basically the AI community is doing now and, and, and stacking more and more nonlinear layers? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good question. I think, I mean, there's a question of, you know, how wide is wide. Um, I don't think I have much um, intelligent to say about it other than if you're trying to optimize for learning speed and want to be able to very quickly learn kind of arbitrary input output mappings you know given whatever representation is being fed into the system which itself i agree probably is learned right the the kind of basis functions that are being provided to the granule cells are probably very task optimized. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to be able to quickly adapt to um, a change, then the theories say that the expansion is beneficial. So it's not the case that an expansion of a factor of five as opposed to 30, at least for the inputs presynaptic to one Purkinje cell, roughly, uh, is sufficient. We, you know, we still get benefits even up to 7,000 to 200,000 determining the ratio. And so yeah, I, I, I think it may be just a matter of wanting to be very flexible. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Nice talk. All right, any last questions? All right, thank you so much guys and have a good rest of your week. Yeah, thanks everyone yeah. for the nice discussion.